Okay, it's a few minutes past seven and we got, uh, we're approaching a hundred folks here online. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with the meeting. Um, really appreciate everybody jumping on. My name is Tony Barretta. I'm an assistant division administrator with the Nebraska Keem and Parks Commission's Fisheries Division. <clears throat> and we're really excited to provide some information for you tonight um, involving a lot of the things happening uh, statewide and in more in detail in the Southeast District. Um, first off, want to uh, recognize some folks in attendance tonight. I see we have uh, a few of our commissioners on hand. Really appreciate your attendance. Uh, Commissioner Ken Curry, uh, Pat Berggren, and John Hoggett are online. Um, so thanks thanks a ton for, for, uh, for popping into the meeting and being available. Um, in addition to those commissioners, we also have uh, quite a few staff members from the Game and Parks Commission, from our fisheries division, wildlife parks, communications, engineering, law enforcement, uh, a lot of folks online attending tonight to um, provide a good experience, help answer questions for all of you out there. And then I uh, wanna send a big shout out to a lot of the volunteers that help out at our, our different events from Game and Parks, uh, expos to fishing clinics, family fishing nights, that sort of thing. Your guys' help is uh, truly, truly uh, appreciated. And we couldn't do a lot of the programs we do without you. So with that, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. See if this program will run for me here. So right off the bat, uh, just want to um, show you a little bit about Zoom. I know a lot of people are fairly well versed in that, but just want, uh, want folks to be aware of the different features. Um, want everybody to keep their, their microphones on mute, which is in the lower left-hand portion of your, of your screen. I think we got most of you, most everybody on mute. And also to help with bandwidth and for uh, pictures and videos and audio to display very well, would like you to stop um, stop your video. Um, by stopping your video, that can help out with, with those features. So if people could click on stop video, um, that would be helpful. Most of you have stopped video, but there are a few out there that haven't. We want to look at uh, the bottom portion of our screen for the chat window. Um, the chat is where we're going to ask folks to uh, type in their questions. Uh, as, as everybody's presenting information, it's, uh, it's a good thing that you can pop in there, uh, type in your question uh, at the time, and we will get to those questions as the, as the program goes along. So that's a great feature. Uh, you'll be seeing some links pop in there, but, but make sure you use that to uh, ask any questions or have any comments. And then also at the end of the presentation, uh, if you do wanna, um, raise your hand or, or make a comment via audio, um, please use the reactions button and you can raise your hand and we can call on you that way as well. So just wanna touch on a few things from a statewide perspective that are uh, new for uh, 2022. Um, I hope everybody has had a chance to peruse the fishing guide. Um, you can pick those up at all of our game and parks offices and a lot of our different permit vendors and bait shops. Um, new for 2022, we have a couple different black bass regulations, as you can see here displayed. Um, they are, uh, there's, there's one regulation that extended this no minimum length limit on smallmouth bass within uh, the canal and reservoir system out in the western part of the state. And then we also have added a few um, minimum length limit black bass um, uh, of 21 inches at a couple of our different water bodies, Buffalohead, WMA, as well as the David City Ponds. Um, we've removed the uh, striped bass, white bass, and striped bass hybrid regulation from Wagon Train Reservoir. You'll be hearing about Wagon Train Reservoir coming up with an um, ongoing uh, renovation and rehabilitation there. We've added Box Butte Reservoir to the um, one fish over 30 inches for a channel catfish. Uh, we have um, made it illegal to 
uh, possess striped bass hybrids, so your wipers, um, in Lake McConaughey at that portion of Lonegren Creek um, up to the highway. We, in addition to that, uh, we have um, made it available to anglers to purchase preference points for paddlefish um, starting this year. This is a, this is a new uh, feature within the paddlefish permits and it gives people that option to purchase a preference point if they don't want to, they don't want to participate in the season that year. And then lastly, no live bait fish um, regulation was put into effect at DeFerre Lake WMA in Western Nebraska. So I wanted to bring, uh, bring a really uh, neat program and uh, feature, feature uh, thing that we have going on in 2022. Back in 1997, we had a, uh, we had a program that was implemented where we started charging uh, $5 with every permit purchase for this uh, aquatic habitat scam. And back in 1997 and prior to that, we didn't really have a funding mechanism to conserve and enhance a lot of our aquatic resources, um, especially when it related to water quality and, and habitat. And with this stamp, we were able to start doing that. Um, fast forward 25 years, and here we are in 2022 with, my program isn't working. Um, in 2022, we are celebrating the 25 year anniversary of that program. Um, it's been very impactful to a lot of anglers. If you've been out to a number of our water bodies that have taken on rehabilitation efforts, um, these, these water bodies are um, by far and away in better shape after these projects compared to what they are going into them. Um, in addition to enhancing aquatic habitat, uh, we also have features that really aid and enhance our aquatic um, or our angler access at these locations as well. And uh, it's been a very, very impactful project or program to a lot of our anglers. And with that, I just want you to uh, be aware and you'll be hearing later in the program that we will be having a celebration event at uh, kind of one of our marquee aquatic rehabilitation sites, Conestoga State Rec Area. Um, later in the summer, June 18th, and we're coining in it uh, a day at the lake where we're going to have a lot of our different partners and volunteer groups and, and just people that um, want to promote um, the aquatic habitat program and um, angler, angler access and just fishing in Nebraska in general. So I invite you out to that event. So this just gives you a a, a quick grasp of all of the, the breadth of this program, what we've been able to do in these 25 years. And as you can see, um, we have worked from one end of the state to the other, geographically spread, um, and have worked with numerous partners and collaborators on, on a lot of these different projects to improve aquatic habitat and angler access. Something else that is going on currently um, and, and most recently as we've started up this week is our trout stockings. Um, our spring trout stocking program is underway. Uh, we're stocking a lot of different water bodies with put and tra take trout fisheries to um, provide the youth and, and new people to fishing to uh, angling for these, for these fish. It's a perfect opportunity right now to take somebody new out fishing, somebody from the youth to, uh, to get on these trout. Um, they're very catchable, harvestable at this time. And it's just a, it's a great opportunity to take advantage of and really go out and make those memories catching fish. In that vein, I want to uh, bring up again uh, a campaign that we've been supporting the, the last few years is called Take Em Fishing Nebraska. And Take Em Fishing Nebraska really emphasizes the need and, and uh, the, the importance of mentoring uh, youth, mentoring new people to take them out fishing. 
how, how we need to provide that opportunity to show them how, uh, how good of a pastime fishing can be, and especially in Nebraska waters. So we invite everybody to take part in uh, take them fishing. There's a link here at the bottom of the bottom of the page. Um, we have a lot of different prizes that we are giving away part of this contest. And uh, really it's a, it's a great promotional uh, tool to show how important our fisheries are to new people. And really, really um, check, out, check out the link, check out what it's all about. Uh, it's, it's been a great event in the past and it's really uh, shed some light on, on how, um, how important that mentorship is to, uh, to folks out there that don't quite know um, how to fish or are brand new to it. And then lastly, another thing that is very um, current, um, things that are going on right now or will be going on is we're, we're starting to do some broodstock collections for a lot of our different fish species to uh, start raising fish within our hatchery systems to eventually stock out into our water bodies. Um, and with this, I, I, I wanna show you uh, a couple really short videos that are uh, uh, communications division and our education division collaborated with us to put together. And it gives you an idea of what we have going on this time of year in the spring when we're going out collecting fish, um, whether it's saugers or pike. Um, this video demonstrates our, some of our walleye collections and hopefully it gives you an inside look in, into some of the um, things that we do um, to enhance our fisheries in the state. Hopefully this, this video isn't too choppy and it plays okay for you. Aaron, you might have to play that for me. So that demonstrated our uh, female collections for our for our walleye um, brood, and this next video will demonstrate some of the egg taking process. So hopefully everybody got a chance to see uh, that video and it and came through okay for folks just to get an idea of some of the things we do out in the field and that are, uh, that are gonna be happening very, rec very, uh, very recent and coming up for our staff. Um, I wanna remind everyone, obviously this is the Southeast District meeting, but we have meetings going on for the uh, Southwest portion of the state, Northeast and Northwest as well. And, uh, We'll have uh, Jordan Cott, he'll be posting a link in the chat box to um, provide registration links for those meetings as well. Um, and those are upcoming this week too. So without further ado, I wanna pass this thing on to our Southeast District staff who will take over and uh, give an update on all things going on in the Southeast uh, part of Nebraska. 
Aaron Blank is the Southeast District Supervisor, and he will be providing that introduction. Yeah, so my name's Aaron Blank, um, Southeast District Supervisor. I, I just want to, before I start, I just want to kind of echo Tony's sentiments, just thank everybody for, for joining in. And, you know, I hope we can provide some really good information for you guys and answer questions that you have. I uh, thank the commissioners for, for tuning in. And, and as Tony said, uh, a lot of the volunteers, uh, we'll, you'll hear about some volunteer work that's going on in the Southeast District later on in this talk. But um, we rely heavily uh, on our volunteers and anglers for, for a lot of different things. And, and this year uh, is probably going to be more than, than what we have in the past. So. Just to get started, um, this is this is our district boundary. As you can see here, uh, we cover the southeast part of the state. And although we only have five percent of the surface water in the state, we do uh, encompass sixty-five percent of the state's population. So because of that, we're we're characterized on almost all of our lakes as high use. And as many of you know that fish around here, uh, that's accurate. Um, and we have the most regulated fisheries. Um, and some of that has to do with the high abundance uh, population and also, you know, some of our smaller water bodies that we have in this part of the state. So altogether, we manage around 120 public water bodies in the southeast part. All of these are man-made reservoirs or sand pits. We have no natural lakes um, other than some oxbows that were created. That would be about the closest thing to a uh, natural lake that we have in the district. I just want to touch, before we get into things, uh, just touch on one major uh, issue that we, that we have in states across the nation have, and, and that's our aquatic invasive species. So in our district and, and everywhere, they can consist of a lot of different things, fish, plants, some different crayfish types, mussels. Uh, there's even uh, aquatic invasive zooplankton that they deal with up north. Um, in ours, the, the, the main things I want to talk about, the first one is white perch. If anybody fishes around here, I hope that you're uh, acquainted with white perch and know the issues that they cause. Uh, white perch are native to the east coast and uh, been present in the district here for about 30 years and it seems like every year we're starting to see uh, these fish expand from lake to lake and the the problem they have is is uh, they're very they're very good reproducers they they don't grow very fast because of that and they become super abundant like is you if you fish out at branched oak and pawnee they become super abundant and they're all typically small so they don't have a lot of recreational value but they compete with all of our other fish species in, in those reservoirs for food and, and cause a lot of problems uh, on stocking issues. So um, if you catch any white perch, you can't transport them away live. You can't even have them in possession uh, live in your, in your boat. So uh, if you're going to keep them, um, I'd encourage that if they're big enough, they do make good table fare, but they got to be dead uh, as soon as they're in your possession. Another one that we deal with, and again, everybody I'm sure is aware of it, is zebra mussels. So we do have zebra mussels in Nebraska. Right now, current locations are in the Missouri River, uh, off at base, the base lake at Offutt Air Force Base. And we had a positive Bellinger sample, which is a um, small zebra mussel, the larvae that was uh, collected by Iowa and Carter Lake. We haven't noticed or saw any adults and we haven't sampled any more villagers there but um, it is another thing we're still going to be monitoring but everybody knows the issues with zebra mussels um, they're they're you don't want them if you don't have them the the causes they can have on infrastructure such as our dam gates and boat ramps and even into your boat motors you want to be aware of them one that we battle probably the most and is probably a little underrated um, in our part of the state is our vegetation aquatic invasive species. So here on the top, you can see curly leaf pondweed and on the bottom right, Eurasian water milfoil. 
these are becoming more and more present at our lakes. The curly leaf pondweed, you'll notice um, at a variety of lakes early in the spring. Uh, it starts growing in January and even into February. Uh, if you fish Youngman Lake in Omaha or Chaplin Lake north of uh, Lincoln, uh, you'll notice this stuff grows and becomes a, a real problem uh, for fishermen to get in and around. And Eurasian water milfoil is one that we're, we're really battling especially in the Omaha area. Uh, you'll see this at a variety one. One last year was really bad with Prairie Queen Lake. And what we just ask you to do, both of these can spread by fragmentation. So even if you just take a small piece of a leaf in your boat or in your live well that stays alive, that can restart a whole new colony um, anywhere it goes. So it just brings the point again, everybody's heard this, clean, drain, and dry your boats. When you pull out of the uh, of the boat launch facility, make sure your trailers are clean, your live wells are dry, um, because again, if, we, if you don't have these species, you definitely don't want them. So kind of going into some projects that are uh, in this current year, the first one I want to talk about is uh, Wagon Train Lake. So everybody knows last year, the, the lake was lowered four feet and uh, the, the whole start of this, we, we had an evaluation in our sediment basin on the north end of the lake and that evaluation uh, came back that um, the sediment trap up there was basically not functioning because it had all silted in uh, over the 20 years from the previous renovation and so um, we, we put together some funding, we're able to get some stuff going, the contractor is currently uh, getting stuff set up out there and should be starting to work here in the next month up in the uh, up in the upper end and we're looking likely for a renovation a fish renovation the summer of 2022 uh, we're still going to drop the lake about another four feet and get a few other things done so again here this is what start the, started the whole thing was this upper end uh, this this slows the sediment down as it gets into the lake and it's not functioning the way it should be. And so it needs to be cleaned out and uh, we're going to re-engineer it a little bit to work a little bit more efficiently. Also with this project, we're going to be doing a new boat launch area and a new dock as well as a mooring dock. You can see this is the existing area down there. Uh, there will be some regrading of the parking lot to go along with it. So we get that water from running straight down the boat ramp on heavy rains, washing gravel in. And then we're also gonna be doing some in-lake habitat. So this isn't a complete aquatic uh, renovation like we've done at Conestoga, uh, just the way this project came about. We're not gonna be able to, to pull a bunch of sediment out at this time, but we are gonna work within the reservoir and um, add some, essentially what they are is shoals, so small mounds with some gravel and some rock on them, and they're gonna be placed throughout the reservoir. And I just wanted to touch base on this real quick because we get a lot of questions about renovations and how they're done. And I think a lot of people think all we do is go into the lake, put in the, the chemical rotenone that kills the fish, but uh, these things are long, kind of long drawn out processes. And so for example, at Wagon Train Lake, there's 59 ponds above the lake in the watershed. And so we have to make contact to make sure all of these ponds are clean. And so the first step that we do typically is we send a mail survey out to all pond owners in the watershed. Uh, in this uh, instance, we had 27 returned right off the bat. And, and this um, we ask landowners if they know what's in their pond, if they manage their pond for certain fish. And the biggest thing is, is we ask them if there's any uh, nuisance species or aquatic invasive species such as white perch, gizzard shad, common carp present in their ponds. So we had 27 returned and what's left, uh, we, we spend the time and go door to door and make contacts with those landowners. Um, and if they don't know, what's in their pond. We survey those ponds with an electrofishing survey or sometimes a seine, uh, just to make sure the fishery is clean. In this instance, as of right now, uh, we have 
made sure 51 of those 59 ponds are clean, uh, problematic species. And we will be getting to the rest of those at some point this year before the renovation. And the other thing is, I don't think a lot of people realize it, but um, just above Wagon Train Lake, there's 40, almost 41 miles of stream in that watershed uh, that need to be addressed. Um, not all of it flows year round, but uh, when we get to the renovation, that stuff will be addressed. And in this instance, we have about 10 and a half miles of real concern that, that are going to have to uh, get chemical in this process is uh, when we do the renovation, we we will walk a lot of it with backpack sprayers, get the whole watershed, and then treat the lake. So it's it's more than just dumping the chemical in the lake. And you know we get a lot of questions about how do you know there's not fish coming in from the ponds above or up in the creek, and all of that is addressed in these renovations. And so I just wanted to shed a little light on that. And if there's, we got other questions about wagon train, we can get to those uh, at the end of the uh, presentation here. Uh, we'll begin fish stockings this year. Uh, we have largemouth bass, bluegill um, coming this fall. And then uh, we'll also be putting in crappie and channel catfish and saw guys. And then muskies will be going in uh, next year. So another uh, renovation that we got going on this year, and this has been a little bit of a process too, is Standing Bear in Omaha, a really popular fishery that uh, has been needed uh, work for a lot of years. So the plan right now, we're still waiting on some permitting, but the plan right now is to draw down the fishery and renovate this fall. And so hopefully sometime um, October, November, sometime in there, we're going to be able to get to it. We are going to be putting in a new boat launch and a kayak launch facility, and there will be some angler access. You can see the parking lot there on the south side of the lake highlighted in red. Uh, we will be redesigning that boat launch facility. Uh, it'll be a double ramp there, and so it, and it should be a better approach to get your boats in than what, uh, what it has been. And there's going to be a jetty there to protect from a west wind or a northwest wind. There will also be some angler access improvements on the north side. And so these improvements are going to include uh, fishing bump outs, and there's going to be a, a little walkway trail uh, up above. We're going to clear, if anybody's been to Standing, standing Bear, there's a bunch of overgrown trees uh, on that point on the north side. That's all going to get cleared and, and regraded where there'll be some new stairwells. Uh, and it's just going to make, make it a lot more family friendly uh, place to fish. We'll also be doing some uh, cedar tree brushing when the lake is drawn down and uh, some more of those underwater shoals like I just talked about it at uh, Wagon Train. Fish docking will be started next year. Right now the plan is largemouth bass, bluegills, crappies, channel catfish, um, and we'll see where it goes from there. Just a couple other things I want to touch on uh, this winter, and, and we talked about volunteers to begin this talk, and um, we couldn't have done this project without the volunteers who showed up. Um, this winter, when we still had enough ice, we were able to pull and place three, about 380 cedar trees. Uh, you can see the areas in red highlight the areas where these trees were placed, and, and they were set anywhere from uh, two to three feet of water all the way out to about 10 feet of water. I know once the ice went away this spring, we were able to get out there and some, a lot of those trees are completely underwater. So they should be in uh, 10, 10 feet of water or so. So we got some shallow water and some, some deeper water habitat. And to the people who did show up, just say thanks again. You know, these projects are, are a pretty big uh, undertaking for the four people in our staff to, to be able to cut those trees and and uh, get everything placed out and blocked. So I'll uh, just say thanks again. And on that note, speaking of volunteers, just want to throw this out there. We were approached by uh, a, an, an eager angler, and he was uh, he's wanting to see a little bit more uh, artificial habitat being placed in some of these lakes where 
we haven't been able to get cedar tree brushing done. And so um, through this, we've, we've kind of been able to work out some ideas and, and we're planning on doing an artificial habitat project at Branched Oak this summer. Um, this is a kind of a idea of the uh, structures that we're planning to build and we're looking to build approximately 200 of these. And so with this, you're gonna have to, uh, we're gonna have to have some volunteers to, to help get this stuff put together and putting cement in. And uh, again, we're looking in a July to August timeline. There'll be more information on this uh, as we get there and, and are able to pick a day. But um, if anybody's interested, um, if you could, at the end of this, you'll, I'll have my email or my, my phone. If, if it's something you think you're interested in, uh, just please let me know and, and we'll make sure you're informed. And, and uh, again, just thanks to all the volunteers. So now we're gonna, I'm gonna throw this over to a biologist here, Jake Warner. Um, and he's gonna talk about some uh, specific projects we got going on currently in the district. So as Aaron said, my name's Jake Warner. I'm a fisheries biologist here, and uh, I'll be going over a few of our special projects we've been covering in the Southeast District, um, starting with our Northern Pike projects. There we go. So our northern pike projects are in Lake Wanahoo and Flanagan Lake. Uh, Lake Wanahoo has been going uh, since the lake opened in 2012. Uh, Flanagan Lake is a pretty new fishery there. Uh, it opened just recently. Fish have been in there since 2018. So that one's pretty young and we're excited to see how it develops. Uh, when we do these samplings, uh, we sample with nets every year right after ice off. So we're just starting this week with Flanagan Lake and we'll be sampling Wanahoo next week as well. And with each of these fish, we'll measure their length and put a tag number in each fish with a unique code so that we can identify the fish later again if we catch it. And then we release each fish back alive. And kind of what like Aaron was saying with the volunteer hype help, uh, this project wouldn't be possible or be very difficult without all the volunteers we get helping on this project as well. Uh, it's a lot of work. We have over 20 nets in each lake and pulling in that many nets and working up all the fish we catch is a big undertaking. So I'd like to give a shout out to the volunteers there and say thank you to them as well. So the Lake Wanahoo project, uh, Looking at total catches since the project began in 2012, we have captured a total of a little over 7,000 northern pike and have tagged about 2,800 of them. Uh, and with their length frequency from the last year's sampling in 2021, we can see that we got a pretty good year class at about the 20 inch mark, a little bit over 20 inches there but we still have some pretty large fish, uh, over 34 inches, some of them pushing over 40 inches that we've sampled in there. And I've heard reports from some anglers that some of them catching 45 plus inch northern pike out of there. So we got some really good size northern pike in there as well as quite a few of those smaller ones from the last stocking that we had that will push through into those bigger size classes as well. And then with that, uh, are looking at our catch trends since the project began, uh, at those initial stockings, took off really well. There weren't a lot of predators in there to eat the younger northern pike that we put in there. So the catch rates at the very beginning of the project were really high. And then they kind of leveled off to around four to five pit fish per net. That seems to be about the average that we get with every once in a while we get a much better year like we did in 2019, where for some reason we were able to catch a lot of fish, but we see it seemed to be stable at right around five fish, four to five fish per net at uh, Wanahoo. Moving on to Flanagan Lake, uh, our total catches since this project began in 2021, once again, a lot younger of a project. We captured 126 individuals or uh, total fish last year and put uh, 113 tags in. Uh, looking at the length frequency distribution of these fish, uh, we got a lot, once again, in that 20 inch range, 
uh, some getting up to over 30 inches, which is pretty awesome. Uh, seeing how this lake is, or this fishery is pretty young, seeing those fish pushing over 36 inches in this short period of time is pretty encouraging. We're, like I said, we're pretty excited about this fishery and the potential that it could have of producing trophy sized northern pike. And then uh, I'll, with the, we'll move on to the blue catfish project, but uh, before I do, I just want to say a uh, quick reminder for the Northern Pike and Wanahoo and Flanagan, there is still a catch and release uh, regulation out there. So just remember that if you go out fishing for them. Now I'll move on to our blue catfish projects. Uh, but before I do, I also want to kind of go over how you can identify blue catfish from channel catfish. These are two species that can be easily confused. Uh, one good way is if we look at the channel catfish on the left, uh, most channel catfish, especially when they're younger, will have spots throughout them, whereas blue catfish are devoid of all of those spots. And uh, sometimes, you know, you get channel catfish that don't have a lot of spots on them, and it can be still be kind of hard to tell the, to differentiate between the two species. So the next best way is to look at the uh, anal fin of these two fishes. So if we look at the anal fin of the channel catfish, you can see it's more rounded whereas the blue catfish will be really straight. So if you fan out that anal fin and it's really straight across the back, that's an indicator, a really good indication that we got a blue channel or a blue catfish. And so this picture is uh, one of our fisheries staff holding up a couple of blue catfish here. And we can see that that anal fin on those blue catfish are incredibly straight, whereas once again, those channel catfish are gonna be more round. So if you're unsure of what kind of catfish you're catching, this is a good way to uh, differentiate between those two species. So for stocking of blue catfish in our district, uh, we have done branched oak and Pawnee in the recent years. And uh, if we, you can see here that uh, stocking of blue catfish in our district seems somewhat sporadic. And that's mainly because we don't have a brood of blue catfish in Nebraska. We have to trade for these fish with other states. So it's not guaranteed that we're gonna get blue catfish every year. So when we do get blue catfish, we try to divvy them out to the waters throughout Nebraska that want these fish. Uh, last year, we were able to get uh, some blue catfish and we put about 3,700 into Pawnee and just under 8,000 into Branch Oak. And uh, next year, uh, hopefully if we get blue catfish in 2022, which we're scheduled to, we'll be stocking them into Zerinsky. And we chose Zerinsky because it ha does have gizzard chat in it. So that has a good, uh, so we're hoping that the blue catfish will have a good forage base of those uh, uh, gizzard chat that are already in there. So moving on to uh, Branch Oak and Pawnee, uh, when we sample these lakes, we sample them once a month, uh, June through September of every summer. We'll measure and weigh each fish that we catch, and then we'll release them back live into the lake. I just want to touch that uh, our regulation for blue catfish on these two lakes is one fish per day with two in possession. So uh, the blue catfish that we put into Pawnee, uh, that 2015 stocking was a last one that we did aside from the uh, stocking that we did in 2021. We've been able to evaluate this stocking. We got good recruitment from it. And uh, it seems that we get about two inches of growth per year from these blue catfish in there since uh, we were able to sample them in 2016, which is really good growth. And uh, we're pretty excited about how this fishery is gonna develop. And we're excited that we were able to get blue catfish again to put in there this year. Uh, the ones we put in there this year were about four inches. So we'll be looking to evaluate their recruitment and their growth in the next, next few years. So now we're moving on to Big Elk and Portal Lake, which are in uh, La Vista uh, in south, uh, southwest Omaha. Uh, you can see these two lakes are just west of Prairie Queen there. Uh, Big Elk uh, got to full pool in 2021. Uh, Portal Lake is still filling up. And we stock these with smallmouth bass and yellow perch, and we're managing them for those fish only. Regulations on these lakes are uh, smallmouth bass, you can catch two fish per day with a 12 inch max, and yellow perch are five fish per day, and there's no live bait fish on these lakes. Uh, these lakes were stocked last year. So we will be conducting uh, our first fish surveys this spring. Uh, some of you may know that we did uh, renovate two rivers, uh, Lake Five and Trout Lake last year to get rid of a bunch of the uh, rough fish that came in from the flooding in 2019. 
And uh, when before we uh, renovated it, we did electrofish it to try to catch all the smallmouth that were in there and move them into uh, big elk and portal lakes so that any of the surviving fish that were in there are now moved into uh, big, uh, big elk and portal. So these are a couple of examples of the ones that we moved on. And then in the next slide here, we'll look at a couple of uh, a couple more lakes that are planned on going into the Omaha area. Uh, WPs one, two, and four are in the planning phase right now. And uh, we're looking for those to be implemented at some time in the future. Okay, I'll uh, take the next section here. So my name is Matthew Perry, and I'm also a fisheries biologist here, stationed in the Southeast District of Nebraska, currently out of uh, Lincoln. And so some of the stuff I'm gonna be going through here with everybody is some of our standard survey results from 2021. So just kind of a disclaimer, there's multiple lakes that we're sampling and on different rotations and things like that. So the lakes I'm going to be talking about specifically with this presentation are just survey results that we did in 2021. So there's obviously other lakes and things like that in the district too that offer good, good fishing opportunities. And so if people have questions about other angling opportunities and lakes other than what we're talking about here, feel free to reach out to us as well. And so, yeah, so this is kind of a summation of the fishing forecast. I know a lot of people really enjoy that publication that we put out. And so it is currently available in print form, also available online. It's the fishing forecast 2022. And then here in our district as well, we kind of like break it down a little bit farther and create an Omaha area fishing forecast that we have listed here on the, on the left of your slide. And then also we have a 2022 Lincoln area fishing forecast as well for people that are interested in angling opportunities around, around the Lincoln area a little bit more. Again, these are both found online as well, outdoornebraska.gov and then fishing. Oops. So the next, next couple of slides then, I'm just gonna kind of be going through kind of some specific, species specific um, sampling results that we had from 2021, kind of looking at bluegill bass, catfish, walleye, sawgrass. And so the first slide, I'm going to have them kind of in two slide uh, sequential order. And so the first one is kind of like the greater Southeast District area. And then the uh, second slide for the certain species is going to focus more on some of our Omaha Metro area fishing. So as you can see from this, just as far as uh, Abundance go stagecoach had our highest abundances of bluegill in uh, 2021 in our trap net sampling with over 120 per uh, trap net. So high abundances. And as you can see, a large, pretty large proportion of that population is in that six to eight inch range as well. And so getting close to those sizes of our anglers are more up to uh, angle for them, catch them, things like that, and take them home for harvest. Um, wild wood would be another one where it's got like some uh, higher proportion of fish greater than eight inches as well as Yankee Hill too, as you can see from the, from the yellow bars listed here. Looking more at the Omaha area specifically, Memphis in uh, 2021 had our highest abundances and a lot of those fish from that six to eight inch range as well. Um, Louisville was second highest, Louisville 3 there at the Louisville State Recreation Area that we have. So high abundance as well for anglers looking for opportunities yeah, to take the family out or just to go and have a fun time catching catching a lot of bluegill of various sizes. Those would, those would be good lakes to target as well. Um, Walnut Creek has got a good population of bluegill as well, and some of those are greater proportion of those over 8 inches as well for people angling for some of those larger bluegills. And just a friendly reminder, Aaron talked about a little bit too, just like our uh, kind of constant com combating that we're doing with aquatic invasive species and different things like that. And so we did uh, sample some white perch and verified them that they were in Prairie Queen. And so that's the first lake within the Omaha area that we've uh, sampled those. And so just kind of 
word of caution for anglers and stuff that are out in those areas. Just be be careful of those that make sure they aren't being transported to other other areas in the Omaha area, and also just to be aware that they are white perch and not not white bass. Looking at our crappie populations a little bit more here. So blue stem had our highest abundances and a lot of those in the five to eight inch range. So people looking for maybe higher higher catch rates, maybe on some smaller fish, that'd be a good opportunity to go for. Hedge field, we had a really good sample at a hedge field and a pretty good proportion of those fish are in that 10 to 12 inch range. They're looking really good. We captured some of those this fall too in there. Really robust, really, really health, healthy looking fish for sure. Make, make for good place. And so uh, Conestoga, that's kind of one of our uh, recently renovated reservoirs. And so that's really, really coming online here too, just a couple of miles outside of Lincoln, south of, south of Emerald. And so that's a good opportunity for people looking for crappies as well in the Lincoln area. I'm looking at Omaha for crappies. Wanahoo, we uh, sampled using trap nets at Wanahoo this past year and uh, did really well. Yeah, almost 100 crappie per uh, trap net in Wanahoo. So that was really, really good to see. There's a really high proportion of them in that eight to 10 inch range. So as those fish continue to grow, it'll continue to provide some really good crappie, crappie fishing in that lake. Weir span as well, we had high, high abundances as well there. Some smaller fish, but as long as they keep keep growing, if we can get some density dependent situations figured out there and keep growing, we'll provide some really good opportunities there. So looking at largemouth bass. So our largemouth bass sampling, we do a lot of that in the spring here, and we use our electro fishing for that. And so some of our results from 2021, stagecoach, another recently renovated reservoir, I think it was about four, four years ago four or five years ago. And so that one's really coming on and really, really high abundances of fish in that 12 to, 12 to 15 inch range. I was on that sampling expedition. I could could hardly keep up with them along the dam there. So there were so many of them. So anglers looking for a opportunity to catch a, catch a lot of bass and have a good time. That would be a great, great lake to target for sure. Conestoga as well, another uh, recently renovated lake. And so this is kind of just speaks to the uh, benefits of doing those renovations and too and just to see how those fisheries populations respond to those renovations and how we have to jump to the top a lot of the times in our uh, sampling efforts and stuff and taking opportunities with the new design new habitat new reservoirs so they do well oxbow trail lake had some larger fish over 15 inches as well and good abundance as well too so that'd be a good good lake to try out here this spring and summer as well that largemouth bass in the Omaha area. We uh, spent with quite a bit of time in that area this past spring as well. And uh, Ball Wright Marina, yeah, that was the highest abundances I think I've about ever seen, about 600 fish per hour. And so really high abundances are there, some smaller fish, but it kind of creates a really good opportunity for people that are going there with family and friends and stuff like that to have a good time just catching, catching a lot of bass for sure. Some of the other lakes that kind of had similar proportion of fish, Century Link, Flanagan's got some really good populations of bass coming on as well. There, newly newly established reservoir, all catch and release the Flanagan as well, too, just a reminder. So good opportunities there. Looking at channel catfish. So channel catfish, we do that with our gill netting in fall. East twin that had our highest abundances. My Hands are still a little sore from working all the catfish out of those gill nets, but really good evenly spaced proportion of size classes of fish in East Twin. I know it's pretty popular with a lot of catfish anglers, and you can you can see why, especially with fish being over that 24 inch range and then kind of more of that eater class of 11, 16, 16 to 24 inches as well. Pawnee's got some really good catfishing as well. So yeah, things looking good in the catfish world. I'm looking at catfish in uh, Omaha. We didn't sample quite as many lakes, I guess, that we did with the uh, largemouth bass in regards to the Omaha area, but we did sample three here. And so we had some pretty good abundances in Wearspan, um, a lot in that 11 to 16 inch range. And then uh, Lawrence Youngman as well. We had some pretty good proportion of that population is over, over 24 inches. So people 
looking for some larger catfish opportunities. That'd be a good, good lake to try. Looking at walleye. So these are some of the lakes that were sampled outside the Omaha area. Birchard, that's kind of been a been a good fishery for quite a quite a while. And as you can see here with just a proportion and yeah, a lot of a lot of nice fish in that 20 to 24 inch range as well. Yankee Hill is looking good too. Overall, our catch rates were a little bit lower than we kind of expected. And so there might have been some sampling biases involved with their walleye. And looking at walleye in Omaha area, Lawrence Youngman, boy, the walleyes, they look really, really, really good in that lake. And so large proportion of them are over, over 20 inches as well. So things look really good in the walleye. Walleye population there at Youngman as well. So switching gears, looking at saw guys. So we've been doing a advanced saw guy, and I guess I could have touched on it too, advanced walleye stockings in the district as well here for about five or six years. And so we've been seeing some really good results with stocking those larger fish in the uh, flood control reservoirs in southeastern Nebraska. And so a couple of the lakes that look looked really good and where I'll be spending spending time this spring at is uh, Willard Meyer and Big Indian with almost, yeah, we, we hit the 20, 20 uh, fish per net at Willard Meyer and then Big Indian was close behind it too. And a lot of those fish are 15 to 20 inches range, which would be really, really nice to catch with some larger fish as well. Metal Ark had some larger fish, and then uh, Pawnee had a little bit lower abundances, but there are some really nice fish at Pawnee too. People looking for large saw guys to get a master angler saw guy potentially probably looking, looking to go fishing at Pawnee. And Tony touched a little bit on this at the beginning too, trout stockings. They will be uh, continuing here this, uh, well, basically as we speak here in the next next couple of weeks with uh, spring trout stockings in different areas. And then, yeah, people that want to follow that a little bit more closely, just follow that link, OutdoorNebraska.gov. Uh, there's a whole fish stocking database. And we do the best we can. We're trying to keep that updated, like, to the day as far as, the fish being stocked and how many and what sizes for trout and all the different species of fish. So then, yeah, just a little neat note, there's going to be some tiger trout going into Two Rivers 5, about 1,500 there. So just a, an additional opportunity there. So. With that, that kind of concludes my portion of the presentation. And now we'll kind of switch gears. I'll probably give it back to Aaron and he can kind of take it from there. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Matthew. Um, again, I just want to say thank you for everybody uh, tuning in. We'll get to the question portion here pretty soon. Um, but one thing I want to point out, um, we, we do these talk, you know, these presentations once or twice a year where, where we get to talk with the public, but um, I really want to point out all of our information is right there on the screen. Um, you can get my information uh, right out of the fishing guide too for the Southeast District. But um, if you guys ever have questions or, um, you know, need information on something, give one of us a call. We're always, we're always around uh, to help out. That's what we do. And it's our job to, to, to help our anglers out with, with whatever information they request. So um, with that, I just want to say, you know, you, you've seen Jake talk and you've seen Matthew talk and you're probably wondering, uh, Jensen over here on the right, um, Jensen just started about two weeks ago. And so I didn't really want to have to put him through too much pain on doing a public presentation right away. But Jensen, if you want to hop on and just introduce yourself and give a little, a uh, little just, uh, talk about yourself, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so, uh, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Jensen Lebsock. Uh, I'm originally from uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, born and raised. Uh, I did my undergraduate study at UNL, uh, majored in fisheries and wildlife there. Uh, and then I went to grad school in Western Illinois. Um, and I did some Asian carp work while I was in Illinois, was a large river uh, fisheries biologist there. And uh, I got the opportunity to come back and uh, I'm excited and ready to help manage some of these reservoirs with these guys. So uh, being from Nebraska, uh, I care about these reservoirs a lot. So uh, bring that passion with me um, as it's home. So 
Yeah. Thanks, Jensen. I think uh, Tony or Jordan, who's ever got the questions, if, if we got some questions in the queue, we can go ahead and get to some of those. Yeah, thanks, guys. I just want to reiterate um, and thank everybody for attending the meeting and, and let you know that now, now is a great time. Um, we see a lot of value in, in a question and answer feedback session. We get a lot out of it, and we hope hope you all do too. So don't be shy. There's been some uh, questions popping in via chat. Um, so continue to do that, and we'll uh, start chipping away at it, at them as we as we go. So I think Jordan's going to pop in here and start directing some of the questions. All right, Tony. This first one is for you. Uh, this is just regarding not only this meeting but the rest of the meetings this week. Are they being recorded? And then where can folks find them after that fact? Yeah, they are being recorded. I should have mentioned that at the start. Um, and the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission's YouTube channel will host these, these meetings. Uh, we should be able to get them up pretty quickly. Um, our communication staff has been really good about helping us out with that. And they should be up probably next week at some point uh, with uh, full full uh, presentations and the question and answer period. So just just uh, type in on YouTube, search Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, and, and you should be able to find these videos on the most recent uploads. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, can you talk about how the walleye population is doing out at Lake Wanahoo? Yeah, so... Um... I see you know, another thing on the chat. Wanahoo wasn't surveyed this year. It, it, and I'll explain why. We we started these advanced fingerlings stockings in 2015, and we did a uh, we did a five year evaluation on those stockings. And so uh, once we got past five years, we're switching switching our lakes because it's it's quite a task. We between the saw guys and the walleyes. Um, there's around 24 or 25 reservoirs. And so um, we're, we're starting to do it now where we're going to hit half of them one year, half of the other. And one who wasn't surveyed this year. However, um, the, the previous year, we started to see a little uptick in that walleye population. We, we will be out there this fall. But everything that I've heard and seen, the, the walleye fishing this spring and even this summer, uh, was as, as good as it's been for a while. And we're going to start to see, um, my guess and intuition, we're going to start to see that uh, start to turn, turn and maybe turn into a walleye lake a little more than it has. Uh, anybody who fishes it has noticed that um, it's, it's, it's different than it was fishing six, seven years ago. And, and we've had a lot of different variables. And one of those is common carp getting in there. Um, and changing the, the structure on our vegetation and, and our water, water quality is degraded a little bit and it probably lends itself a little bit more uh, to our walleyes. And so uh, we'll continue to monitor it. But, but right now, um, I, I, I knew of a bunch of people that went out there fishing and I've seen uh, quite a bit online guys doing pretty well out there. So um, look forward to the, the fishing forecast next year, and that'll be our, our gill net samples from, from this year. Kind of sticking with Wanahoo, has there been any thought of putting a slot limit both on walleye and crappie out there? Um, not really, no. In, in, I'll start with the crappies. Crappies are a, a cyclical spawner, and Anybody who fishes one who uh, probably knows but what we get is these big year classes about every third year. And those year classes, um, because there's so many fish, growth is sometimes can be pretty slow until we start getting to a, to a size when um, anglers start taking them off, taking them out of there. What, a, what, a, what some length limits would do, um, it just suppresses that growth until you you get them to that size you want. So even if we had a 10 inch minimum or a, you know, a slot of eight to 10, 
until those fish reach that growth and you start anglers start harvesting them it just suppresses um, those until you you get enough fish out of there and then that growth goes and then we'll start getting a few more fish the, the one thing i would say and that we always encourage is selective harvest on those crappies um, anglers have a tendency to, to harvest from the top down meaning um, you know if you're catching a bunch of eight inch fish and then you catch one 10 inch fish a lot of anglers will keep that 10 inch fish where what, what we would encourage and what's best for that fishery is to harvest those fish or the most that are the most readily uh, available and the ones that you're most readily catching because those are the fish and the size of the fish where that growth suppression is taking place and so um, we'd encourage that and as for the walleyes um, right now with the advanced fingerlings um, because they're we're getting stocked every year uh, those are almost managed as a as a put grow and take you know we want those fish to be utilized and right now um, we're still seeing a lot of uh, mid to upper 20 inch fish uh, coming out of there and so it doesn't appear that we're having this this the suppression where anglers are harvesting them right at 15 inches and we're still seeing fish in there uh, we'll continue we're always we always continue to monitor all of this and uh you know we have specific goals in place for our walleye and saw guy stockings to, to make sure they're successful and and we'll continue to, to to do that into the future thanks aaron Jake got a question about uh, blue catfish and branch stoke. Are they naturally reproducing? Um, we have seen some cases where we do see some small, like really small juveniles, probably young of the year. There's just a lot of competition with those very small fish in that reservoir. Uh, what we don't see is recruitment from those from those uh, really small young of the year juvenile stages into other year classes. Uh, this year, I think we saw one fish that was maybe eight inches long out of all the blue cats that we were able to capture out there. So if there is reproduction going on in the reservoir, uh, recruitment from that reproduction is very limited. There's been some work done in Texas looking at kind of what factors go into having successfully reproducing and recruiting populations of blue cat. And what they found is size of the reservoir can be one of the best predictors on whether that uh, reproduction will be successful. And what they also found is the minimum size of those reservoirs needs to be about 5,000 surface acres. So, and uh, branched oak and Pawnee, uh, it's not impossible that we could get some natural recruitment out there. But uh, we think stocking right now is the best way to keep bolstering those populations. And, and just to add on to it, Jordan, before we go on to the next question, uh, I've, I've been out there, and, and Jordan, who's taken the questions, has been out there as a biologist for a lot of years. And Jake is right on. Every once in a while, we'll see some small two to three inch fish, and that, it's still a rarity to see those but we've never seen those fish being recruited to our electro fishing gear, uh, ones that, that wouldn't fit a stocking. And a lot of it probably comes down to just the, the severe competition uh, that all young a year fish go through in there um, with both the gizzard shad and the white perch. Uh, we've, we've seen the same thing on channel catfish. We, in, the, in oh, somewhere in the last six years, we did an evaluation out there looking at our stocking contribution of channel catfish uh, compared to the naturally recruited. And, you know, we're in a we're in a very good area for catfish recruitment in the Midwest. But uh, even out there, Branched Oak, we found that about 70, 60 to 70 percent of the fish that we catch in our gill nets are stocked fish. And so even our channel catfish, which you see. When you're out there in the boat, you see thousands upon thousands of small channel catfish uh, every every late summer, early fall. And even those, it doesn't seem like they get pushed through that first winter. Those winters can be pretty harsh on on small fish if they're not in good condition to, to get through the winter. Right, thanks, guys. Uh, Dean, this one's for you. This, uh, 
a couple questions about um, if anglers want to donate funds uh, for either restocking or to help maintain or improve conditions out there, how should folks go about doing that? We've had that uh, in the past with some of our angling groups, such as Muskie Think, uh, donated money for uh, minnows for feeding the muskie when we're raising them in the hatcheries. And if they just contact us here in the main office in Lincoln, uh, we can work with them to how they want the money to go and then work with our budget fiscal department to make sure that we can appropriate those funds in the appropriate locations. Okay. Thanks, Dean. Uh, this one could go to either Aaron or Matthew. How are the wipers doing in Zerinsky? I can take that one. So we were doing some sampling out there with Gil Metz and Zerinsky in 2019. It's the last time we we're out there uh, looking for wipers and walleye catfish and things like that. And that we actually did pretty well. We had uh, six per Gil Metz when we we're out there with the uh, wipers and so I think that's kind of a product we started doing some uh, advanced wiper stockings out there too probably I think we started in 20, 2018 2019 2020 with those been alternating kind of like some spring and fall stockings just to see what seems to be taking the best and yeah we are seeing some we are seeing some wipers out there now and so probably the next time we go out there we'll see see even more which is the hope with our continued advanced advanced stockings and wipers out there so well, ours oh go ahead i was just going to say we'll be there this fall okay so there there will be some more information too in the in next year's fishing forecast from this fall survey so and then as far as sizes go there in 2019 look like they were between kind of like that 12 to 15 inch range something like that a lot of them were and then some smaller ones too so Thanks, Matthew. Um, Tony, this one is for you. This is in regards to a program down in, uh, or a similar program in what Texas runs. Has Nebraska ever considered doing a, uh, a shared bunker program for bass management? Um, so we haven't, we haven't gone down that route uh, completely. However, it is, it is important to note that we are thinking about genetics and genes when it comes to, uh, comes to bass management and that there is, there, there's some great neighboring states or, or, you know, states down in the South that have programs that, that um, it may not be something that we would exactly follow, but I think it is important that we start looking at some of those potential genetics within our bass populations where we get uh, brood stock collections, raise, raise our eggs from, and that sort of thing. And that's all um, starting to uh, develop more and more internally within our staff. We're starting a um, black bass management committee that's going to involve a number of our fisheries staff um, to uh, kind of look at the way we manage our black bass from management to production uh, to aquatic habitat and those sort of things. Take a look at what we're currently doing, what we've done in the past, and then kind of uh, the goals and, and the changes in our fisheries, the changes in angler attitudes, and how we can adapt and, and better manage for those things. So that's all uh, going to be taken into consideration, um, including that sort of stuff as far as uh, looking at genetics within, within different bass populations. Thanks, Tony. Um, Question, Aaron, if uh, some anglers want to volunteer their time and labor, what's the best way to accomplish that? Well, the, the best thing that I would tell you to do is my, my information is right there, still on the screen. Um, email works really well just because then I have your information right there in the email. But if you, you know, if you want to discuss different ways that you can volunteer or um, you know, different projects that you're interested in, you can always give me a call and uh, um, we can talk to, but, you know, in, in, an email, just explaining who you are, what you want to do. That way I have everything on record. It, it works really well and, and I'll get right back to you as soon as I can. And there, there's going to be, 
I, I think here in the future, there's there's going to be um, opportunities that a, it, we'll see how this one goes this summer. And um, it's something I'd like to see a little bit more of. So. All right. So speaking of, of those opportunities, so you talked about uh, the wagon train cedar brushing and uh, the artificial stuff going into Branch Stoke. Are there any other plans for um, uh, man-made type brushing events at other lakes outside of those two that you know of that are coming up? Yeah. So there's, there's one that I've been uh, approached about at uh, Weir Span Lake in Omaha. Um, there's an angling group that's working in conjunction with um, some Boy Scouts um, that are going to be building some some structures. And, um, and again, if you if you if that's something that interests you, um, you can go ahead and send me an email, and I can get you in touch with that group that's doing that. And, and we're going to be involved in it too, on and helping place those structures. Um, but right now, the plan, anyway, is is for that uh, Boy Scout group to be building those structures as as part of their projects, and then we'll go from there. Um, but for now, artificial wise, that's that's what uh, I know about. And uh, Again, we're going to, this is kind of a pilot run this summer at Branched Oak, and, and I hope it's going to be successful and everything's going to work. We're still, we're still definitely early in the planning phases on this. There's still some other things that we got to cross off the list before we can do it, but um, we're just trying to get things, get our ducks in a row so that when time comes, we're ready. Um, and there's always going to be, every year, we're going to try to be doing some some cedar tree brushing, and we can always use help on those too. Okay, uh, sticking kind of with branch stoke and uh, other areas with white perch, what are some ways to manage them once they get into a system like branch stoke where renovation is not necessarily a feasible option? Yeah, so it, it's a difficult question, and it, it's one that that uh, we're still learning. Branched oak is it? They're uh, they're kind of a pain in our side, and and in Pawnee too, they they cause a lot of issues on what and when and and how we can stock those fish and how big we have to stock fish in there. Um, we've we've done and we've worked with UNL to look at some diet studies at Branched Oak specifically to see if there'd be any way to biologically control those. Um, and so far, you know, we know fish eat white perch, but definitely not to the uh, degree that we would need them to, to control that population. And so at that point, our, our biggest issue is keeping those fish contained in the reservoirs where they're at. And, and that's a problem, a real serious problem we've had here in the last five to 10 years is, is uh, it seems like we're seeing these fish go from reservoir to reservoir to reservoir. And there's not a lot of ways that those fish can get moved around unless they're, they're going into a bucket. And, you know, we, we just don't have them in a lot of private ponds or in watersheds above these reservoirs. And so um, the only way they're getting there is, is coming in. And so trying to contain the spread and, and uh, just making anglers aware of the problems that they cause. And, you know, at some point in branched oak may not be there yet, but, you know, at some point in some of our smaller reservoirs, the, the best way to, um, to do anything about them is to do a full fishery renovation and, and, and get them out of there and restart over. So. Kind of along those same lines, is there a chance that cast nets will ever be allowed in eastern Nebraska with some sort of restrictive rules? At, at this time, we, we have no plans to, to open that up. And, you know, as a fisherman, you know, I understand, I understand the concern and why people want it. Um, I've also been witness to the people who haven't 
uh, done it the correct way. And, and our law enforcement can, can attest to some of this too is, you know, it, it's kind of the, the same thing where um, just the one bad apple, but to be honest, it, it takes one person to, to make a mistake and it, I mean, it can end up costing a two or $3 million renovation if those fish are moved into a, to a new reservoir where they're not currently there. And so um, right now there, there's no plans, at least on my end, that, that we'll be allowing it anytime soon. So. Okay. Uh, let's talk about portal and big out. Uh, Jake, you want to talk about how long you think it'll take the smallmouth and yellow perch to reach a decent size? So this fall on uh, NEPCA, a guy posted a picture of some of the uh, smallmouth he's catching out of there. Best we could tell, they were already pushing seven inches or so. Just pretty awesome growth considered they're stocked at, you know, three to four. So catchable ones might be getting in there in the next two years or so. Uh, for the yellow perch, uh, it, it's hard to say right now. Like I said, we'll be evaluating it in the next few weeks, and that'll give us a better idea on kind of what their growth is looking like in there and when it, and that, that should lead to some inferences on when we'll see some uh, harvestable size fish in there. And then can you also touch on the question asked about portal and big elk, but just on our new reservoirs in general, why we allow harvest right off the bat as opposing to uh, keep them catch or release for a certain amount of years, either Jake or Aaron? Well, the, the, the biggest thing with big elk and portal um, that is maybe a little bit different. So, so one, just, I just want to start out by saying something that's very important to know about big elk and portal is, and the reason that they have what they have in them is because we can contain what's in that watershed. So up above in those watersheds, there, there's no uh, other ponds present with any bluegills or largemouth bass. So as long as we can keep that contamination of bluegills and largemouth bass to avoid that competition between species, uh, we think we can be successful, and, and we think that the smallmouth bass, as long again, as long as there's no competition with largemouth bass, uh, are going to have a natural recruitment. And that's something we will be monitoring, and, and every year uh, for the next five years, we'll be out there sampling. Um, as for the yellow perch, again, I, I understand the concern and, and the difference, and the thing I would tell you is, is uh, these are essentially going to be stocked as a as a put and take fishery, and so they're going to get um, recurring uh, stockings every year. And so we want to provide opportunity, um, since it is especially to a, a you know a desired species, and we're going to be monitoring to see how much pressure these get and and see what comes out of it. And um, you know this is kind of a case study for us. We haven't stocked this. Uh, this duo in this district that that I know of, and so we're we're kind of curious how it works, and and if it works as we should as we think it could, uh, those smallmouth will need some harvest. Um, although I, we're afraid we might get a little uh, too high a density when we want to manage that smallmouth population for some larger fish, not just a high density. Thanks, guys. Um, Tony, you want to talk about uh, cutthroat and brook trout possibly being stocked in the Omaha metro area and why they currently are not? Yep. We've, we've primarily stocked those, those two trout species in our, our central and western Nebraska waters, and that's mainly because we have... Um, fairly cool temperature water quality that is supportive of trout, you know, year round in a lot of those either, either stream situations or, or small ponds and lakes that, that provide that opportunity for, you know, a put grow and take scenario compared to just our, our put and take. So those are some of the primary reasons behind 
having those fish stocked uh, not in Omaha. But um, in the same token, we aren't ruling that sort of thing out for the future. I know cutthroats are one of the more difficult fish species to to catch as part of the part of the trout slam as well. So um, we will uh, we'll definitely take a look at that. Thanks. Um, Aaron, are striped bass being stocked in Branch Stoke? And can you touch on how the previous stockings, uh, how those turned out? Yeah, I can touch base on it. We, well, we, we had tried striped bass in there previously, and um, we didn't see we didn't see a lot of recruitment on those. Um, again, we're, we're going to just continue to monitor this. You know, it's, it's again, it's another desired species that, that anglers want to see. Um, some were available. And so um, they're not, they're definitely not going to do well in our smaller reservoirs. So um, we'll continue to monitor this again and, and, and see, you know, sometimes it's, it's just a matter of the year or the time that they're stocked. If, if they can get on the right food source and, and uh, again, we we'll, we didn't see a, a lot of success in that first go around. They're also a very hard fish to sample, similar to wipers. Um, they're they're a little bit streaky, I guess, in your catch rates. You could say where sometimes you you get the net set in the right spot and and the school goes through, but uh, a lot of those times too, there you just miss them. And so um, they are a hard fish to sample, but. We'll be we'll be out at Branch Oak like always quite a bit this year and and in the upcoming years and we will be uh, we'll be looking for them. I don't know, Tony, if you have anything else you wanted to add on to that or not. No, nope, you hit it, Aaron. We we uh, we have a couple older stockings that should be older fish, and we have a couple recent stockings of fish, and yeah, we're going to continue to do our best to assess those. This one is kind of for Aaron and Tony. Uh, this is, what are your feelings as far as the advancement in fishing electronics and how that relates to a uh, potential increase in catch rates? And how does that relate back to fish management? Yep, this is a, this is a pretty hot topic in the fisheries world. Uh, obviously not only in Nebraska, but um, throughout the Midwest and really the the nation is how are these um, improved technologies going to affect fish populations uh, for the future? And can we sustain this sort of uh, potential, potential harvest? And one of those things, you know, we, we continue to preach and Aaron mentioned it earlier. Um, and we, we hope folks continue to be conservation minded as far as um, selective harvest and, and harvesting harvesting those fish in the populations that you, um, you plan to eat and, and obviously not, not um, taking more than you can. There, we're, we're still really in, a, in this infancy of, of a lot of the major technologies like live scopes, live imaging. Um, and there's, there's still a lot of questions to be had just as far as uh, how, impactful or how how much are our catch rates going to be going to be uh improved real recent study done by uh, some of our neighbors down in kansas uh, provided some insights into uh, really the catch rates between folks that used uh, a live imaging uh, sort of sonar compared to non um, maybe provided slightly higher catch rates but they weren't really significantly higher to be impactful on populations. That was in a very brief study that was done, but it, it did provide some insights in as far as um, maybe their impact isn't as big as it could be. However, like I said, infancy study, a lot of things going on that um, we're gonna continue to keep our eyes on. Um, obviously, we it's gonna be hard to limit that technology or ban it, it's already out there. So uh, what we will likely have to do is, is adjust, you know, potentially in the future, 
uh, bang limits, size limits, those sort of things to help spread out this harvest compared to, you know, the old adage, 90% of the fish um, gets caught and harvested by 10% of the population. Aaron, you can you can add on. I know you're uh, you're fairly in in tune with with the live live imaging world as well. Yeah, this the the one thing I would say that that uh, is is maybe a concern too that that it's definitely something in the back of our head is you know the further north that you get the the slower growth rates and the slower growing seasons and so you know impacts to fisheries can change based off of that too. Um, and it's something that we're keeping in mind and um, I have fished with the the live imaging and and it's definitely uh, an advantage. And so, you know, going forward, um, as Tony said, it's something we're going to be keeping an eye on. And as always, technology is always advancing. And, and you know, I can remember 10, 8, 10 years ago when sight imaging came out and you thought, geez, this is, this is the best thing ever. You know, it's going to help us find all these fish. And it just continues to get better and better. And so um, this is something that, you know, it's not specific to Nebraska, and and there's, I would imagine, there's going to be a lot of, uh, there's going to be a lot of scientific work done uh, on the effects uh, on catch rates of of live imaging and and whatever comes next here in the future. And so um, we'll be sure that we're versed in it and and plan accordingly. All right, thanks, guys. Um, kind of. In terms of growth rates, Tony, can you talk about uh, F1 hybrid largemouth bass and how they might work out in Nebraska uh, and specifically how Kansas has started stocking some of those and how they might turn out here in our, our neck of the woods? It's, it's hard to completely uh, have much confidence in speculating how they would do here in Nebraska. One thing that we do uh, rely upon and we, we work very well um, with is our neighboring states. We, us, um, you know, the fisheries profession, the uh, conservation agency um, staffs among different agencies in different states don't operate in silos. We, we attend a lot of different meetings, collaborate with one another, and we, we, take, you know, some of the um, experiences those, those folks have across borders and across regions and try to, try to emulate them here if, if it makes sense. So we'll, we'll continue to have conversations with our neighbors to see how things are going. And it's, uh, it's one of those things that we never want to take anything completely off the table until, uh, until proven otherwise. So we'll keep, our, we'll keep our ear to the ground on that and continue to have those conversations about F1 hybrids. All right, thanks, Tony. All right, this next question is for uh, Jeff Jackson, our uh, aquatic habitat program manager. Uh, could you touch on future plans for Alexandria SRA and the uh, renovations coming for down there in the next few years? Sure, yeah, that's a really, really timely question. Anyway, we're uh, just kind of in the design, maybe not even design phase we've just started having that conversation about doing some work on on those um, we did some work on the east lakes about 25 years ago um, that was pretty successful and we saw some pretty good results um, there was common carp stocked in there maybe about 10 years ago and we've seen that fishery decline over the last 10 years and it's it's in need of renovation now and one thing we hired a consulting firm to take a look at the dam and they said that the dam was in horrible condition. So uh, we we'll be, uh, that's definitely something that needs to be addressed. Um, and we're doing work on the dam. We'll probably be doing some deepening and maybe some angler access work on, on Lake number three at the same time. So that's in the planning stages, probably I would guess 20, 23 before we're probably going to be uh, doing any serious work there, though. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Aaron, 
Can you talk about uh, predator fish management at Branch Stoke and why almost all the large predators are catch and release except for blue catfish? And if there's any plans to potentially change that moving forward? Yeah, yep. You know, right now I would say, I guess there's there's nothing on the table or or in the planning phase. I would say it's never off the table if we would if we would ever see um, you know a bunch of big blue catfish coming out of there. Currently, you know we're we're very um, conservative on our, on our blue crab regs where you can only have one fish a day, and um, they're a tough fish to catch you know, in general too. And so um, it's not like a, a channel catfish or something like this. And, and I do get the concern because, you know, there are rare fish around here. And, you know, some of the stuff recently down in Kansas has really promoted uh, blue cat fisheries. And, and, you know, we continue to learn uh, a lot of information from um, Milford Lake and the biologists down there. And uh, we'll always put that into action. I think one thing that, that's important to note is, is you know, hopefully we're going to be finding a, a little bit more stable source uh, for our stockings of blue catfish in the future. Um, things are at least looking a little bit more positive than they had been. And so um, if we can continue to get fish in there too, I, 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 I'm not too worried about uh, the fishery crashing out there. But again, if we, if we see that trend or we see stuff happening, it's definitely stuff is on the table to, to be able to help um, address it. So, um, right now, again, right now, nothing on the table, but, uh, but we'll just see in the future and, and we'll continue to, you know, get as many hands on those fish as we can just to, to, to really get some good science done on them. Um, last, well, almost last question, I think, can you talk about, uh, Muskie, both tiger and purebred muskie stocking in Omaha, both where where they're currently stocked and any future stocking plans that, that you guys have. Yeah, so right now in Omaha, currently we, we have our, our muskies at uh, Zarinsky and they'll be getting it here. Um, I don't know, Matthew, if you got the current list up with you but we'll be stocking them into Zerinsky. Yeah. looks like we'll be putting 510 of them into there yeah and we uh we have we have them on the list for this this year um at cunningham lake so that's the that's the plan now and in, in the lincoln area we'll have timber point we have tiger muskies at Conestoga and wagon train will is also planned to, to get pure strain muskies in the future after the renovation. Uh, Jeff and Aaron, are there any habitat improvements or angler access uh, projects planned on the Nebraska side of the Missouri for foot traffic anglers? in the upcoming future? I can probably chime in a little bit on that, but uh, right now we do not have any uh, any plans for doing any shoreline access on the Missouri River. I, I wouldn't want to rule it out in the future, but at this point uh, we don't have anything on the drawing board for that. All right. And then, uh, Tony, do you, if you could just touch on the largemouth bass management uh, group that uh, that's going to be taking place again and how how that's going to going to happen and what your your envision for that. Yeah, we're just starting to form a team here to, uh, like I said, um, take a look at our black bass management. So mainly mainly our largemouth bass and smallmouth bass fisheries, how we've, how we've managed those in the past and how we're currently managing them. 
uh, not only from a from a stocking standpoint, but also from uh, regulations and uh, habitat manipulation, habitat enhancements, those sort of things standpoint. Take a look at all these different facets of the fishery and what we've been doing in the past and currently and um, how we can look forward towards different goals. Um, you know, a lot of our, uh, a lot of our anglers are uh, starting to change um, as far as different mindsets, uh, conservation minded, some of them trophy um, oriented, others obviously harvest oriented. And, and so we're trying to do our best to look at uniqueness of fisheries to best manage for black bass on a statewide level. So that means do we need uh, individual water body um, goals that are different than some of the regional approaches. And so we're gonna do our best to form a team um, and really delve into this topic. And um, you know, as Aaron pointed out and the crew pointed out earlier, these public and private partnerships uh, with our staff and these angler groups doing, doing habitat projects and uh, doing other things to uh, help enhance our fisheries are going to be part of that. Um, I can see them being more and more important and part of some of the recommendations that come out of that committee. So we're really looking forward to uh, kind of getting this process rolling and, and seeing where it goes in the future. So um, you'll be hearing from us about it and uh, we'll, we'll we'll definitely be getting uh, angler and constituent input for this for this process. So thanks for thanks for the questions out there about it and uh, um, appreciate appreciate people being interested. All right with with that, I think we've addressed all the questions we have, so I'll turn it back over to Tony for any other remarks. Yeah, I just want to uh, once again reiterate uh, and thank everybody that's uh, stuck on this long. It's it's been a long meeting, but as you can tell, with a uh, bunch of fisheries folks uh, that do this for a living, with with a lot of people that are very passionate about it and that are anglers themselves, uh, we could talk about this stuff for for hours upon hours. And like Aaron said. Uh, their contact information is right there. They're more than willing uh, and able to, to chat with you at any point in time to help uh, make your guys' and gals' fishing experiences better. So uh, appreciate everybody attending. Uh, also want to turn it over to Dean Rosenthal, our, our fisheries division administrator, to uh, give him the opportunity for any last comments as well. I just want to take the opportunity to Thank the Southeast crew and Tony and Jordan to a great job. A uh, lot of good input, a lot of good questions. Uh, great job in, in the presentation and answering the questions. Uh, we've got a great team here and uh, really appreciate uh, our commissioners being able to join us on this uh, as far as uh, the ones that we're able to. And just thank everybody for attending and, and we'll be doing it. Uh, another meeting tomorrow night uh, for the Northeast. And uh, so we'll just keep moving ahead on these things. And if you have any input or any questions, please, please contact the Southeast crew or any of us here in the main office. Thanks again for attending guys, appreciate it. Yep, and I just wanna echo the same thoughts. Just thank everybody for, for tuning in and, and again, our contact information's there, you know, we, everybody here in our district office, we're anglers just as we are biologists. And so, um, you know, all of us grew up fishing. It's, that's the reason we got into the profession we did. And so, um, you know, there's, there's not a, a whole lot different than from us compared to everybody else on this. And, um, you know, we, we, we rely on our anglers uh, for a lot of things and, uh, Again, you know, our information's there. Feel free to get a hold of us with anything we can help you with. And, and just want to say thanks for tuning in.